Thank you, Mark, very much. Uh, let me just set up here. Um, on, be on behalf of CMS and the Division of Chronic and post acute Care and the Home Health Quality Reporting Program, I want to welcome you all here to the uh, two-day uh, Home Health Provider Training event. Uh, I have a team from the uh, program back there. I guess if they were to describe me in uh, three words, uh, the three words would be that uh, he's never satisfied. Uh, which I think is good. Uh, I've been at CMS now for uh, over four years. I came from the IRF world, uh, ran a stroke rehab unit for most of my academic career, and um, also administratively helped uh, to run the hospital that was uh, part of that uh, unit. Um, also, I had experience uh, when I first started at University of Maryland uh, running an LTAC unit and uh, even uh, during uh, my time at uh, university, at times we also covered uh, patients in nursing homes as well. My experience in home health was uh, uh, well, hearing stories from my team members who were moonlighting uh, at home health agencies. Also, uh, writing the orders for uh, patients who were either leaving my unit or um, I had a geriatric uh, faculty practice as well and so I'd be ordering there as well. And uh, one thing that I recognized at that time was how difficult it was to be a, a home health nurse in particular because I would not infrequently get calls from the nurses uh, who were desperate because if I ordered uh, uh, home health services on a patient after leaving my unit, uh, they oftentimes could not contact the uh, follow-up physician to get either the, the follow-up orders done or if there was a medical problem. And so uh, I would sometimes, legally or illegally, uh, have to help them uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know, taking care of those patients after they left. Um, and when I arrived then at CMS, I have spent a lot of time uh, in the home health program. It's actually become my favorite program. Uh, continue to get uh, more impressed with the work and the job that uh, many of you do. Uh, it's a services you're providing are for very much a heterogeneous group of patients. Uh, they kind of cover the spectrum of all the other post acute care settings. It just so happened that they are at home and are homebound and getting their services now at home. And so it's a very heterogeneous type of patient population that you need to take care of. And then from a program standpoint, in terms of us uh, running the quality reporting program, we have to take that into account. And then also the heterogeneous uh, agencies that are involved in terms of their agencies that take care of 10,000, tens of thousands of episodes a year. There are agencies that take care of just a handful episodes a year. And so how do you develop a quality reporting program that uh, makes sense with that heterogeneous patient population, with heterogeneous types of agencies that are out there, um, makes it a challenge. And uh, I like challenges. Uh, you may have heard me on uh, star ratings calls. I've been involved a lot in terms of the development of uh, star ratings. Uh, but today I'm talking about something uh, different than that. This is the, uh, the largest initiative that we have right now in a post-acute care uh, quality programs. And this is the, and thank you, Mark, for doing the acronym for me, uh, the Improving Medicare Post-Acute Care Transformation Act, or the IMPACT Act. And so I'll be talking today about the IMPACT Act of 2014. Today's uh, objectives are first to discuss or give background on the IMPACT Act, to describe the uh, purpose and implications and really the potential that's involved in uh, data standardization. You may have heard other talks on the IMPACT Act, and it's, a lot of those talks have concentrated on the uh, 
the measures, the measures that are starting and the application dates of those measures. Today I'm really going to focus more on data standardization and the potential that uh, uh, that has. Other objectives are to explain the CMS quality strategy. CMS, by the way, is Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, and really to look at how the goals and the priorities of the Impact Act and data standardization really help to fill some of the gaps that are in that uh, CMS quality strategy. Then finally, objectives just to go uh, and look at the timeline and milestones that are uh, uh, part of the Impact Act in home health in terms of the home health quality reporting program. The next three slides are the acronyms that will be used today. I will attempt not to speak too much uh, acronymese, uh, but hopefully you'll, uh, uh, you'll be able to understand most of what I'm saying, and these are for the next three slides. You also got, by the way, I pulled out the sheet that if you need it. The acronyms are here as well. Going on to the sixth slide, which is the title of the Impact Act of 2014. The Impact Act is a bipartisan legislation that was passed in 2014. Uh, at the time it was passed, uh, President Obama uh, stated to um, Gene Moody Williams, who was the CMS representative at the signing, that this was the first piece of legislation he had passed in a long time that was supported by everybody, both parties, uh, both uh, chambers, uh, House and Senate. It was universally liked as uh, legislation. Uh, it remains liked as legislation in uh, the uh, recent confirmation hearings for the new administrator. Uh, Chairman Hatch even asked her during the confirmation hearings after describing the Impact Act, saying, are you committed to uh, implementing the Impact Act? And so Congress still has their eyes on it and views this as very important. And the law requires the standardized patient assessment data across post-acute care to enable, as listed on this slide, the improvements in quality of care and outcomes, comparison of quality across post-acute care, transparency in the data reporting, information exchange at first across PAC settings, hopefully beyond that, enhanced transitions of care and care coordination, person-centered, goal-driven care planning and discharge planning, and modeling of payment based on the individual patient characteristics and, and not the setting of care. Driving forces behind the Impact Act are listed on the bottom of the slide. First, it was the, the costs associated with post-acute care. Uh, home health, for example, uh, if you look at uh, 2014 data, about 3.4 million Medicare beneficiaries received home health services uh, from a little over 12,300 home health agencies. And the Medicare payment in 2014 was uh, about $18 billion. If you looked at all four PAC settings that are part of the Impact Act together, the spending in 2014 was a little bit under $59 billion. You go to 2015 data, which was just in the MedPAC report that came out in, in March. Home health is $18.1 billion now, a little bit more. Post-acute care settings, the four of them together are a little bit over $60 billion in 2015. And if you add hospice in, you're going up to now $76.5 billion. So um, there are a lot of costs associated with uh, the type of care that we provide. Then the other reason, uh, the driving force, is the lack of uh, data standardization and interoperability across post-acute care. Go to the next slide. 
the importance of standardization of data is not new. It's something we've recognized in post acute care for, for a long time. In fact, MedPAC, in their uh, first report to Congress that they gave back in March of 1999, stated that there needed to be a core set of uh, uh, standardized patient assessment information uh, done in post acute care. The following year, BIPA, the Benefits Improvement and Protection Act of 2000, Congress required uh, the Secretary to report on uh, standardized assessment items across post-acute care. That was followed by the Deficit Reduction Act in 2005, where Congress directed CMS to, to test the concept of uh, the uh, standardized assessment data and the standardized assessment instrument, and that was done in the post-acute care payment reform demonstration, otherwise known as PAC-PRD. It was part of the PAC-PRD that uh, there was the development of the uh, continuity assessment record and evaluation tool, which is otherwise known as the CARE tool. And uh, that, test, that tool was tested and developed uh, during that time. As an aside, uh, a, the Deficit Reduction Act of 2005, if you didn't know, also established the Home Health Quality Reporting Program. It was a big act. Uh, I think there was 5201C was the Quality Reporting Program, and I forget the PAC-PRD number, but uh, it was all done at one time. And then at the next slide, we're now up to slide nine. The important part of the PAC-PRD also is that the development and testing of these standardized data items uh, needed to meet the federal HIT, or Health Information Technology, interoperability standards. And that's been important on an ongoing basis, that everything we're looking at in terms of doing and developing, we really want to look towards the future. I mean, this is, this is just the start. And, uh, my generation may not be as savvy. My kids' generation is much more savvy in terms of health IT. But we need to continue to look at making sure that whatever we're developing makes sense in that world and can be used. So anyhow, PAC uh, PRD was done. 2011, CMS reported back to Congress on the successful consensus-based development of these items, the uh, successful reliability testing that was done, the positive feedback that was uh, uh, received as well. And also, uh, they were able to report that individual characteristics uh, could be used to help to uh, predict uh, resource use for services that were uh, needed for a patient. 2013 then, Congress held uh, hearings on post-acute care, followed by a letter to stakeholders, and uh, they reported that they received about 70 letters back. And the resounding theme in those letters was that we needed to have standardized assessment data throughout post-acute care. And so therefore was born the IMPACT Act in 2014, the next year. Go to the next slide. The goals at the time of developing the standardized data are listed here in the check marks uh, to foster the seamless care transitions, information that follows the patient, that's very important, longitudinal outcomes for patients across settings, ability to assess quality across settings, improvement in outcomes and efficiencies, and then also with the reusability of this data, a reduction in provider burden. Guiding principles in development of these items at that time were also that, first of all, the data be uniform. The data be reusable, informative, have reliability and validity, and that it facilitate patient care coordination. And then in addition, that this uniform data be interoperable. It can be communicated in the same language across settings, 
and can be transferable backwards and forwards for care coordination. And again, that this is information that can follow the patient. Go to the next slide. The goals and priorities that were part of development of standardized data fit in very nicely with the aims and priorities of the uh, national quality strategy and then also the goals of the CMS quality strategy. The aims of the national quality strategy being um, healthy people, healthy communities, uh, better health care, and then um, improved uh, affordable costs. And then the priorities that were in the national quality strategy are these six goals in the CMS quality strategy. Making care safer, strengthening person and family engagement, promoting the effective coordination and communication, promoting effective prevention and treatment of chronic disease, working with communities to promote the best practices of healthy living, and making care affordable. On the next slide, important to know that Data Standardization and Impact Act in particular helps to address some of the more challenging goals in the CMS quality strategy. And those goals are listed right here, including the strengthening person and family engagement, promoting effective coordination and communication, and promoting the effective prevention and treatment of chronic disease. On the next slide, it, I always joke, it would not be a CMS presentation without a Venn diagram. And so this is your Venn diagram for the day. Uh, collection of data and standardization is not new, going on before the Impact Act. In fact, many of you probably know that um, OASIS was first uh, thought of or uh, by Congress back in Obra of 87, and they asked uh, I guess HICFA at that time to develop uh, assessment items. Uh, so there were data elements that were available and are available, and there were assessment instruments that were available within these different settings or um, systems of care. Uh, and they were standardized, but they were really standardized within that setting alone. Sometimes, and we try to start working on it, we were able to standardize some of the items, make them uniform across all settings. But for the most part, we hadn't done that. Impact Act allows us to increase this central area. My colleague, Stacy Mandel, loves to call it, I think, the sweet spot of uniformity. And so to increase this sweet spot to make it larger and larger so that these data elements are uniform, and they apply to most, if not all, of these settings. And so on the next slide, what we're talking about in terms of standardizing items um, at the atomic level is that we have these core data elements. And the example here is eating. And so essentially, you would have uh, a single element of eating, same definition, same collection, same response, same coding, in all the different assessment instruments across post-acute care, whether you are using the MDS, the OASIS, long-term care data set, or the IRFPI. I apologize for not doing the acronyms. But again, the concept being same. Same everything across each setting. And on the next slide, I actually noticed that you actually have this in your handout here. This is right here. This is an example of a standardized data element that is uh, now being collected in OASIS. And this is the element of lying to sit, sitting on the side of a bed. And the definition of the item is the same, the coding defined the same, collected the same, no matter what setting that you're in. This item is now being collected uh, as a risk adjuster in the pressure ulcer measure. 
And it's essentially what's written on the slide here, one question, one response. But the goal is, even if we have one question, one response, we can get many uses out of that response. And that's what you also see in the um, bottom right corner of that slide, that you may have one response, but that could be used not just as a risk adjuster in the pressure ulcer measure. It could hopefully be used in other quality measures in the future. It uh, could be used for uh, home health agency quality improvement activities. Surveyors may uh, be able to use the element uh, uh, prior to their survey. Be used in care transitions. It can be importantly used in the longitudinal care that that patient uh, is receiving. And also could be used in uh, payment modeling. So again, this is what we call when we say we want a data element that's reusable. And so in the Allen Levitt dreaming ideal state, we're looking at real-time use of standardized interoperable data that can be used for care coordination, on-time clinical decision support, and provider-level quality improvement across different settings. And that we would have this information following the person across the healthcare settings and into whatever services uh, they would otherwise need. And that we would work towards a patient-centered system of care. So that if you look at the future, you would have a person that is uh, uh, receiving care in any of these different settings, whether it's acute care, post-acute care, uh, doctor's office even, and that they would have standardized data elements that were part of an electronic medical record that could be interoperable in all these different settings. And as mentioned on the bottom, information following the person. This is the ideal state. So how are we getting there? Well, the T in impact stands for transformation. And that's our mission. Our mission here is to transform and modernize the healthcare system, to use this data to facilitate the rapid, accurate exchange of the critical patient information, to be able to measure and report comparable quality across provider and provider types, to enable decision making, uh, make it person-centered decision making using comparable data so that it will be based really on the data that the individual person has, and then also to inform future payment models. And going on to the next slide, we have certain principles that should be applied as we're getting this done. And that is, as I mentioned before, is that we want to allow for this data to be reusable. So you collect it once, use it multiple times for multiple different purposes. We want to create a common spoken language Right now, the world of medicine is, as I call it, a Tower of Babel. We try to talk the same thing, but we all use different languages when it comes to talking that. And what we need to try to do as best as possible is figure out how to develop a common language to say what we want to say. And we want to make that language an IT language so that it can be used electronically as well, because that's where we are now, and that's where the future is certainly taking us. And so this will enable interoperability and will facilitate care coordination. And we want to be able to have this data to be used across the entire system and wherever else it could possibly be used. Then the next slide is, again, guiding principles that the data elements that we would develop or change are data elements that 
should reside in the public domain so that even while initially adhering to the statutory requirements of the Impact Act, that these, da these data elements could be developed or they could be changed through the consensus-based process or the application of current science. And because they're in the public domain, we would not need to go through any third party in terms of trying to get this done. And so getting from the dream to the reality, the Impact Act requires the reporting of standardized assessment data. And as I said, this is just a start. And providers need to submit the standardized assessment data through their assessment instruments. And the data needs to be in five categories. As I joke, I say five plus categories because they always have the other there. Those five categories include functional status, cognitive function and mental status, special services, treatments, and interventions, medical conditions and comorbidities, and impairments such as um, visual impairment and continence. And that this data be collected and submitted on admission and discharge, and then more frequently if required, and there are additional different application dates depending on the setting. In home health, the applicable reporting uh, provisions are that it be reported uh, by January 1, 2019. And then we go to the next slide, which is done to uh, test your vision. Uh, this slide is uh, the timeline requirements, the milestones that are associated with meeting uh, the mandates of the Impact Act in home health. And so in the top uh, corner on the right, uh, legend one are the different uh, measure domains uh, from the five quality measure domains and the three resource use and other domains that are there. And then below that, legend two in the, in the far right are the data assessment categories that I just mentioned before. A and the red line are the, is that Impact Act milestone timeline. So that would include when uh, these mandated either measures or assessment items need to be first submitted, reported, when confidential feedback reports would be coming back to home health agencies, preview reports would be coming back to those same agencies, and then that these data would be publicly reported. So for example, uh, for the measures that uh, application dates were just the beginning of this year, January 1, 2017, you um, should start receiving confidential feedback reports around January 1, 2018. Sometime later in 2018, you would, you would receive your first preview reports for what would be uh, getting publicly reported. And then the public reporting of that uh, information would begin uh, in January of 2019. Then the next slide are uh, different resources that are available. The includes the listing, uh, PDF is all the, by state, the education coordinators. Uh, their email address for the quality reporting program and for uh, payment policy. There's also the Keys help desk, uh, as well phone numbers, emails, and then the website that you can go to, the support website as well, are listed there. And then just to conclude, I see I have a minute 10 there on the clock. Uh, this is just the start. Uh, as I tell my team, if it was easy, it would have been done already. Uh, there's an enormous challenge in terms of getting this done and getting this done successfully. I've been around a while. I graduated from medical school in 82. Um, 1983 was when um, DRG's IPPS was uh, begun, 
over 80 during my medical school was when I think uh, home health help really got the Medicare, the clarification of payment for home health was there. Um, what we are looking at and we're trying to do is something that should have been done a long, long time ago and, and wasn't. Uh, I tell my team members a lot, most of them are a lot younger than me, that the, this work is probably going to be the most important work that they're going to be doing during their entire career. Because this is the type of work that will hopefully not just be uh, done in post-acute care, like it's being done statutorily, but hopefully can be applied and be expanded throughout the healthcare system, particularly for our most um, vulnerable patients. And so, you know, during your next two days here, and after you leave and uh, you help to train others, you know, remember the importance of this work. It's going to be challenging. The devil's in the details, it always is. And there are a lot of details. Uh, and we you know, have to be able to continue to move ahead because it's the right thing to do. It's something that uh, we need to look towards the future and a future where this type of information, if done and if done correctly, can really help transform healthcare system. So um, thank you for all your work. And thank you for listening to me. And I will wait around, I guess, after uh, Kathy is done. And uh, if there's time, we can take questions then. So uh, Kathy? You're, you're next up. Transfer from one Connecticut person to another.